Hey everybody, how are you doing? Super excited to be with you. You know, there's a lot of ways to find fix and flip deals, but some take longer to cultivate the relationships or to make them happen. And, and some can be extremely profitable and others maybe not as much. But you need to take some time to build relationships, learn those complicated strategies, and that's gonna be what we're talking about today. Today we're talking about finding deals as fast as possible. So I'm gonna talk about seven different strategies that can help you find deals as fast as possible right now. Here we go. The seven fastest ways to find fix and flip deals. What we're gonna be covering today is the seven fastest ways to find those deals, how your area plays a part in deciding what strategy you should be doing, and a bonus strategy because, heck, I couldn't just leave it at seven even though I wanted to because it's a cool number. First off, there is something we need to be talking about, okay? There is something we gotta realize. Is fastest ways going to be the most profitable ways to find properties? Those two may not be the same. Fastest does not mean it's the highest profit. We're talking about how you can get it the fastest. We're not going to, we'll be talking a little bit about profit in a bit, but I don't want you to get confused with speed versus profitability. So the question is, is like, hey, if you can find a deal really fast and only make $5,000, or you, if you took a few months and you could make $50,000, which one would be better? Well, from my vantage point, it'd be better to spend the time and make the $50,000. Now, that may not be for you, and that could be changing, but today is talking about fastest. We'll get into profit a little bit, uh, but what's the fastest way? So I really want you to keep this in mind as we are going through these things. These are going to vary from area to area because if you're in Fort Worth or you're in um, North Carolina or you're in South Carolina, Hilton Head, or wherever the case you may be, this is gonna vary. Um, so this is why I'm showing you seven different strategies because not all these strategies are gonna work in your area. Some of them may, some of them may not. So you've gotta work through these. So number one, fastest way to find properties is to find them on the multiple listing service, okay? This is where agents list properties. You want to search for keywords like cash, investor, fixer upper, those are things that you wanna be looking on that kind of gives us a hint that they need to move those deals fast. Um, and so number two we wanna talk about is finding wholesalers. <coughs> Excuse me. Wholesalers are people that are acquiring properties, putting them under contract, and selling that contract to somebody else. Sometimes they'll close and then sell it. So getting relationships with wholesalers that actually can be bringing profits on, properties on an ongoing basis. You can build this network by being a part of real estate investment communities. Those communities can be in person or online. On Facebook, you can find a lot of real estate investing communities. And they get properties at a very good deal. Then they sell that to someone else that wants to do a fix or flip or wants to do a rental at a premium and they make the difference in between. That's the whole idea of wholesaling. Number three is driving for dollars. A great way to find properties fast. Traditional banks only lend on properties that are in FHA condition or inhabitable. What if the property is uninhabitable, meaning you can't live in the property? Well, if that home needs work, that seller has a problem. It's gotta do one of two things. They are either gonna have to spend the money to get the property into an inhabitable condition or they're gonna to have to sell the money to an investor that is gonna have cash or is using hard money. There's no in between there. Uh, Bank of America, Bank of West, Bank of whatever, Chase, they're not gonna lend money on a property that is having problems or could have the potential for problems. They wanna make sure it's in good condition. So if you own a property that's not in good condition, how are you gonna sell it? You're gonna find a cash buyer or a hard money lender, or somebody that has a hard money lender, or do the repairs yourself. And most people just don't have the money to put the repairs into it to then sell the property. So what are we looking for? As we're driving around and we're looking for things, we're looking for overgrown yards, we're looking for blue tarps, broken down cars, we're looking for fire damage properties, we're looking for broken or boarded up windows, Looking for construction materials that maybe just be hanging out there. There might be some fire damage or some missing siding. If there's no blinds in the property, it probably means it's vacant and nobody's actually living there. We talk about peeling paint, if it's a paint on the outside or if the siding looks like it's bent up or broken or has issues, that really tells me there's some neglect there. Um, also vacant, if we know that property is vacant, nobody's living there, vacant properties are a liability. You've gotta pay for taxes, you gotta pay for insurance, and you've gotta pay for upkeeps. 
the grass doesn't cut itself and you've got to water it and those types of things. So there's, there's an expense to that. Number four, foreclosure, and this is going to be notice of sale. Now realize foreclosure is a process, not necessarily a destination. So what happens is you get behind on payments and the first thing they're going to do is send you a nasty gram and say, Hey, you're behind on payments and we're going to hit you with a 30 day late. And then it's going to happen again. They're going to say, you're going to get a 60 day late on your credit report. And then they're going to say, you're going to get a 90 day late on your credit report. And usually somewhere in there, that's where they start looking to take some legal action when it comes to a traditional home. <coughs> Excuse me. So then what they do is, is at some point they'll file a notice of interest or a list pendants. They being the bank that you owe the money to, or that person owes the money to. After some time, the next thing they're going to be doing is what's called a notice of sale. And it puts everybody on notice that this property is going to be sold and it's going to be sold to the highest bidder. Well, what we can do from the time that notice of sale gets published to the time the sale actually takes place is typically around 30 days. And in that 30 day process, you can go after properties when they're notice of default or the list pendants, or you can wait until they have the notice of sell because it's about 30 days before the actual sale will be taking place. When that sale takes place, these guys are going to be getting kicked out of their property. There may have to be an eviction afterwards, but the fact of the matter is they're no longer going to own that home. Number five of the fastest ways to find properties is private auctions. These are bank owned properties typically, and they go to an auction company where they want to have properties liquidated. So this is a popular one, Hudson and Marshall. You can check this out. And if they have properties in your area, it's one where you could say, Hey, I'll buy these properties now. Also auction.com has been very popular. I've actually bought properties from auction.com myself, um, and had some good success there. Also Williams auctions is another one. And there's several other auction houses that are doing auctions. Now you're gonna say, Ryan, you always say don't do auctions. Well, let me clarify. These auctions are actually private auctions, not public auctions. Public auctions are ones you're going down to and you're bidding at the courthouse steps or wherever that property is being auctioned. The problem with those is you can't necessarily get in the property, right? You can't just show up to the house and say, let me in the property because those guys are saying, no, I own this property. I don't have to let you in. So you're buying a lot of things sight unseen if you are going um, on the uh, on that foreclosure type of, of a method, buying at the foreclosure sale. The other thing is you can't, it's very hard to get a lender to fund that deal because they want to know what they're getting themselves into. They want to make sure they have contractor bids. They want to make sure they have a scope of work. So there's a lot of speculation when it comes to that. The other thing that can be a concern is title insurance. When you go buy a house from the court, court, court when, <laughs> I can't speak today. When you go buy a house at the court steps and it's a bidding situation, there is no title insurance. So if you end up buying a second or a third position, it's too bad. So sad, um, for you. So unless you're more sophisticated, you really shouldn't be doing that. Now let's talk about what these private auctions actually mean. Private auctions basically mean that it's typically a bank or um, someone that's liquidating a bunch of properties and they put it up. Now, the nice thing about these is you can typically get inside the property. You can typically um, walk the property. You can typically get hazard insurance. You can typically get a full title policy and all of those things will come together. Um, so it's a little easier because you don't have to take some of those risks that you would of not seeing the property. I call it more speculation. Number six, for fastest ways to actually find properties today is what's called estate sales. Somebody passes away, grandma, grandpa passes away. The family needs to sell the home and they're saying, what are we going to do now? What my experience is, is lots of times these houses are not in the best condition. Now they may be in good condition, but they're out of date. It's got old, you know, um, avocado fridges or some of that type of stuff, which by the way, those run a lot better than the fridges we have today. Just, just saying, just for the record. Um, they last like 30 years and fridges today last like five years or maybe seven years. So, um, so it, it's in poor condition or it just is not, um, in the type of, of condition that most home buyers are actually looking for. So what happens in these situations? Well, <coughs> the family members end up getting the property. 
it may have to go through some estate sale. Um, and so if that, or some, some uh, probate, excuse me. And in that process, there's usually some family members that just want their money. Some of them want to keep the property, but most of the time the people who want to keep the property don't have the money to keep the property to pay off the other people or other family members that may have that. So those houses typically get sold. One of the great things that can happen is you can purchase those properties from families and you can get them some cash quickly and they can disperse and it is usually a good thing for everyone. So that's uh, estate sales is a great one. Now, number seven in my fastest ways is for rent by owners. The fact of the matter is most people probably should not be landlords. There's very few people that should be landlords. That's not uh, to put anybody down, but the fact of the matter is, is landlords are cut from a special cloth. And if you're not part of that cloth, you need to either learn those things so you can be, or you need to hire someone to do property management, or you need to just decide there's other avenues that you wanna be going down. Because here's what happens. A lot of landlords simply get burnt out. Burnt out mean they are just tired of the problems. And so right after a tenant has trashed a property, it is all about timing when you're calling these guys. Um, so what you're doing is calling saying, hey, would you be interested in selling your property rather than renting it? And they may say yes, they may say no. If they say no, I'm saying, would you be interested in selling any other properties that you may have? Um, and there can be a conversation that can start now. It is a numbers game. You've got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find that prince or before you find that great deal as the storybook would say. Now, my bonus number eight, I did not want you guys to not see this bonus number eight, but this bonus number eight is city violations. City violations. Well, what is a city violation? Well, if you grow your, long, your yard too long, then you're going to get a city violation and they're going to fine you. And if you don't have the money to take care of that, then the city's going to come out and they're going to cut it and they're going to fine you some more um, overgrown yards. They can, they have some issue with the house. And if it's not corrected, there's going to be a fine. And if it's not corrected, it's going to go in front of a judge. Now, if they don't have the money, if the homeowner doesn't have the money to fix these problems, then it's probably a best option for them to actually sell their property. Now, there you have it, guys. The seven fastest ways to end up finding properties. Now, again, these are not necessarily the most profitable ways. They are the fastest ways. And so the question is, is how can I get fast with some level of profitability or the highest level of profitability? For example, if something's listed on the MLS, there's gonna be bidding wars and lots of people fighting over those and even real estate agents that are investors themselves going after those same particular deals. Whereas if you look at the properties from wholesalers, they're increasing the price. There's a lot of competition that drives up the price. So those are things you've got to take in consideration as we talk speed versus profitability. Now, 